Welcome to the Podcast Discovery Show, the podcast that's about other podcasts, where every single week we have a book club style discussion about a podcast that we recommended last week. At the end of this episode, we're going to recommend a brand new show. We're going to talk about that one next week. I'm Kirk. And I am Zach. And this and week we're talking about Kirk's recommendation from last week, The Fantastic History of Food. And we actually had a cool way that we found out about this show. Yeah, so Podcorn did not pay us to say this, but <laughs> we, uh, we've we used Podcorn a few times to get advertisers on our show and also to advertise on other people's shows. And one of the people that reached out to us to be an advertiser was this podcast. And we picked people that we really thought was kind of like in our ethos, in our vein of like shows that we would recommend and when i read what it was about i'm like there's no way that we probably can't talk about this one because it's we love history we love food put those two together you got some really great stuff i mean literally a lot it's like war but about food you know it's like history Mm -hmm. of like crazy stories but related to food um and the two episodes that i recommended were episode 19 Tomatoes were blamed for witchcraft and werewolves in episode 15, Three Tales of Cheese. Uh, what was the subtitle there? From Egyptian Mummies to Uruguayan Cannonballs. Uh, so much. There's just so much to that yeah. one specifically. I loved the cheese one. I'm not going to lie. It, it was, yeah. No, the it, but mainly just because it was ridiculous, <laughs> some of the things that were happening in it. But, um, yeah, uh, the ho- the... The show is hosted by Nick Charlie Key. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's in South Africa. If I'm if I'm mistaken, I'm sorry. All the social media and stuff points to South Africa. Um, but he's also an author of a book, a best-selling book called The Bant Wagon Cookbook. First of all, I love the play on words like bandwagon, but bant wagon. Uh, but I, what made me think of what made me like well, what's a Bant cookbook? What does that mean? And I did a little bit of research and it kind of made me have like a mini discovery about what a Banting diet is. And essentially, I would say our equivalent for us to wrap our minds around it here in the US at least would be it's very similar to a keto diet. But it was invented by this guy named William Banting. Uh, He was a notable English undertaker. And he was formerly obese, but he's known he's well known for being the first to popularize a weight loss diet based on limiting intake of carbohydrates, especially those of starchy or sugary nature. He undertook his dietary changes at the suggestion of a physician, Dr. William Harvey, who in turn had learned of this diet type of diet, but in the context of diabetes management. So basically, he's the one that popularized uh, a low carb diet. And so that's why they call it the Banting diet in other places. Uh, here we call it the keto diet, uh, but I think well, yeah, it's very was, similar. I feel like there was like five other yeah, I mean, what, trend what, what diets right South before Beach that. Diet at yeah, one point. Yeah, South point. Beach diet. Um, I feel like most diets paleo in general. Paleo is very similar to it. It's, you know, there's a lot of them. But anyway, uh, Nick Charlie Key, he's a cool guy. This is a fairly new ep- new show. I think he's like a few – maybe 20 something episodes in. So, but it's a, it's a very well-written show. What I really like about it is, um, like I said, it's similar to lore where you can tell that the, the, the show has been written and, uh, very well researched, but that means that you can get a transcript of the show. And I love that. It makes things a lot easier. If you miss something or there's something you want to reference, On his website, he's got a really nice website for the show as well. Um, He's got all the links for all the sources and stuff. And I I, I just love when someone is that intentional to put the effort into sharing all the links and stuff like that for a uh, a show that they spent so much time researching. Yeah, you can tell that he has put in the time to understand these things, but then he also has a knack for storytelling. Uh, It it is something where... Throughout it, you're learning sometimes ridiculous things. We will definitely get to some of the... <laughs> actually, it's ridiculous in both of these, like full-on ridiculous. 
the things that he's talking about, but both of them are heavily researched. There's a lot of instances that he references, but then it's fun to listen to. Well, fun and terrifying. Honestly, that's the thing is the cheese one I feel like is fun. Mm-hmm. The tomato one is more terrifying mm-hmm. than that. I listened to another episode and I wanted to bring it up, but it was two episodes back to back and I didn't I didn't want to talk too much about that one topic. It was about coffee. And I think we mentioned it actually maybe a little bit last week, how like coffee at one point was it, it was illegal longer in some countries than alcohol. Hmm. Uh, and to the point where p- people were being killed if they were seen drinking coffee. <laughs> it's just crazy. And it's dark, but it's also just like history's crazy. And I don't know. It, it was fascinating. But so let's jump into the episode specifically about tomatoes first. Yeah. And this is definitely one of the okay because we've talked about a couple times on the on the show where it's all nice and it's all fun and games to be like oh i'd love to go back to different times in history and experience the history and then you read about the history and it's usually nightmare fuel and this is definitely one of those times because essentially tomatoes developed a reputation during the era of like the Salem witch trials. And apparently what I didn't realize is this was a huge thing, not exclusive to any one region, but just pervasive across the world. It sounds like the Western world at least. I thought that it was bad here, you know, in Salem, Massachusetts and, you know, kind of more unique to here in the United States, but apparently it was real bad other places as well. What, what did they say? Like 500,000 people. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. There's yeah, they, just, they said across Europe and the West, essentially, there's a chance that 500,000 people were killed during the Salem witch so trials. Many people guys. And it's yeah. crazy. Cause it was all most of the time made up and looking at no, re- all the time. There was no witches. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I'm saying like <laughs> yeah. half the time it was like not even for a reason. It was like, yeah. I don't like my neighbor, so I'm going to say she's a witch and literally she'll be killed. Uh, it, it was just it's it's mind boggling when you look into the whole like witch scare or whatever it's called, uh, whether here or abroad, that whole thing was just ridiculous. Um, yeah, it was. And so that's kind of the backdrop on why tomatoes developed this weird thing. And and yeah, they are very close to the nightshade family. My brother insists that he uh, has a light nightshade allergy that causes him to feel sleepy when he eats tomato products. Yeah, I remember Josh saying he had a little bit of an allergy to tomato products. I think it's just because he gets tired when he eats pizza. And so he says that's, (laughs) that's what it is. For some reason, I get tired when I eat pizza or spaghetti, so I must have an allergy it's, it's to the tomatoes. Allergy to nightshades. <laughs> um, but the thing that was crazy to me is not only was it like involved with witches or whatever, but somehow it got morphed to tomatoes will turn you into a werewolf. Yeah, and all of it is kind of based off a tomato is closely related to other things. And obviously this is like pre-science heavy theocracy and like weird times. So there was no voice of reason on, Hey, that's not actually the plant you think it is. But this all started because I think he said the Pope literally said that the witch's concoction that she makes is some kind of plant. And the plant kind of looked like a tomato plant and that's it. That's literally it. But then tomatoes became this thing where people saw tomatoes in your garden. They're like, oh, oh, no. She's got the devil fruit. She's going to be a witch. (laughs) Yeah, but they also mentioned how like the plant, the tomato plant looks very similar to nightshade plant, which is poisonous. And the, you know, the fruit for like cherry tomatoes looks very similar to a mandrake, which is also poisonous. So early uneducated people, they obviously, you know, were very skeptical of anything tomato-y. 
because they thought they might be poisoned as well. That actually makes a little bit more sense. That does make witch, more sense than the, the witch, witch stuff. Than the witch angle that. of all of this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, being afraid crazy. of poison is a good idea. Something that stood out to me, just talking about this absurdity of the witch scare, which now we're going to go to a different absurd thing, which was the Spanish Inquisition. But there was something that kind of clashed with these together, which was <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition we've talked about recently, actually. And it was just ridiculous, crazy. Oh, it's just, it's one of the, it's very similar to the, to the witch thing. It's just, it's crazy. But during the Spanish Inquisition, to believe that witches existed was to be a heretic and then you could be killed. So you couldn't even accuse someone of being a witch because that means you believe in witches and then you would be killed. So Spain ended up being one of the safest places to eat tomatoes. <laughs> I mean, what what can you do? They're, they're playing that next level game where you can't call anybody a witch because then, you, then you're saying there are witches and that's, uh, that's illegal. It's it's just We're crazy. Throw you and in then the they ocean. talk about the uh, I need to look that up real quick. That that to, that giant tomato fight that they have every year in in Spain. Yep. Spain has some amazing, just crazy customs. Uh, some of them a lot of people don't like, but some of them are just like. Oh no, they know how it's to just party. Crazy, they do know how to party. I've been to Spain, and I would love to go back as an adult because I went as a kid, and I saw everybody having such a great time, and I was like. This is awesome. And I wish now I, I want to go back as an adult now that I can drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, yes. about, I was like, you could say it. It's okay. That's why I'd want to go there too. Tapas and Spanish wine. Let's go. La Tomatina. It was, it was canceled this year because of COVID, guys. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> just another casualty of the, of the pandemic. But it's, it's uh, La Tomatina is a festival that is held in Valencia town of Buñol in the east of Spain in which participants throw tomatoes and get involved in a tomato fight purely for entertainment purposes. And it's like, <laughs> if you haven't ever seen a video of this, you should look one up because tomato fight is the real definition. Like it's honestly surreal. The amount of tomato that's just everywhere after this thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I, I do want to go to the running the bulls and watch people just be real stupid. I also want to go to this. No, I would participate in La Tomatina. I would, I would participate in this. I would never participate in the running of the bulls. No, I want to not. see people do stupid stuff and hopefully not get killed. Actually, we've, we've done research and very few people get killed, but people get hurt all the time. People get uh, hurt every time, but they <laughs> rarely die. Uh, but yeah, uh, we've talked about doing a trip to Spain, a PDS Spain trip. We've got to do oh, and it. It'll happen. It'll happen post pandemic. Yeah. I mean, definitely now, at least now we have a reason other than not having enough money. <laughs> I know it makes me feel better about it. It does I make me feel go. better. We're like, we can't go on vacation, not because we don't have enough money, but because, because of COVID. we can't, because we're being safe. <laughs> now when COVID's over, it's going to be because I don't have enough yeah, then money. It's back to, we don't have money again. And we don't need to think about that time. Nope, we don't need to think about that. Uh, but apparently the reason that tomatoes were, I guess, class or people thought of them as something that could make you turn into a werewolf is because the translation was like wolf peach. <laughs> I wish that it was still called a wolf peach. Tomato is a stupid <laughs> word. Wolf peach is a great word. It sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as you heard it, I was like, well, that's dumb. They shouldn't change the name ever from that. How do you change? <laughs> Wolf, Wolf peach sauce. How, how do you change the name of anything, even if it wasn't a tomato? If it's called a wolf peach, it is permanently a wolf peach. It's not hard. Just leave it. Leave it there. So good. So freaking good. Um, and then there was a... Go ahead. They go into one of my favorite parts was when they all thought that it was going to kill them. So there was multiple, like the guy, they called it a suicide attempt where a guy sat down with like a, a bucket of tomatoes and people were playing like a funeral march for him. And everybody's just like <laughs> watching like, oh, he's going to die. And he just ate a ridiculous amount of tomatoes and then went home. <laughs> it's like the olden days were uh, different. They were, uh, they were very different. And then there was also uh cook tried to, uh, Poison George Washington with uh with yes. tomatoes. 
Yes, he did. And I mean, surprisingly, that did not kill George Washington. George Washington didn't die, guys. He is he immune just had a to great wolf dinner. peaches. <laughs> um, so that was the episode about tomatoes. Was there anything else you had on the episode about tomatoes? I don't think so. No, there's. Uh, I mean, I, I can ask you, do you like tomatoes? Some people, I, feel I like love that's, tomatoes. That's kind of like I, a hot take for some people. Some people don't really like them. I love them so much. It is one of those things. It's like some people do not like them like at all. They're like, I love ketchup, but I hate tomatoes. Um, I mean, I'll say this. Ketchup is not Don't tomatoes. like V8. I will say that. I do not like V8. Um, it tastes like salty. It tastes like I'm drinking the sauce out of a can of like SpaghettiOs. And I just, it does nothing for me. And I it like also it gives right. me heartburn immediately. Like before <laughs> I actually drink it. I think just when I see it, I get heartburn. Um, but I can also take or leave tomatoes when they're not in season. You know, because I feel like a lot of times when you get like a hamburger, like a fast food place, it's like a white tomato. It's like, yeah, that tastes like wet nothing. So I'll pass. I have to have a tomato on a lot of different things. Um, PB and J. Yes, that's one of them. Uh, I love tomatoes. Uh, Hot dog. I <laughs> ice cream cone. I, I have chopped tomatoes and put them on my hot dog because a hot dog's a sandwich, and I feel like all sandwiches. Do we need to get need into to this have right hot now? dogs? Okay, or tacos all sandwiches are sand- need to have tomatoes. Is what I'm uh, trying to say. Here's the thing. <laughs> I feel like okay, we can let's go here. Sandwich debate. We're going there. Hot okay. dog is a sandwich. Hot this dog is, is a, a sandwich. That, and I really don't have too much of a horse in this fight, but that means that tacos are sandwiches. Exactly. And that Thank also you. means that Pop-Tarts are sandwiches. I don't know about that no. one. No, <laughs> bread outside of filling. <laughs> Ice cream sandwiches, same thing. I mean, I'm fine with saying a Pop-Tart's a sandwich. I mean, it's a gross sandwich. Are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, uh, it, it's essentially like, I don't really care. I'm just saying, as soon as we open up that, burrito's a sandwich. Like, as soon as you start making it so everything's a sandwich, yeah, you can just say everything's a sandwich. No, but, I mean, I think a burrito is more like a wrap, you know, or was a wrap, know, an American a wrap is <laughs> bread on top of toppings. Uh, but yeah, uh, hot dogs are sandwiches. And now the food czar of the Gravity Beard interns, Paul Chomo, the host of Varmint's podcast, has now officially come out and said that hot dogs are sandwiches after like four years of pressure he's finally caved and said that hot dogs are sandwiches i also and think that he could be doing this to just troll people the other way because then he will have trolled every single person in gravity beers and turns <laughs> i mean he definitely trolled me because i've been telling him all along a hot dog is a sandwich but anyway i have put tomatoes on my uh, hot dogs because it's great yeah, no, it's and the Chicago dog has definitely leaned into putting lots of veggies on there. Mm-hmm. So that's not that crazy. But yeah, then we get to cheese and the crazy things that happened with cheese. Uh, first of all, I was highly disturbed by the origination of cheese. By right? The, uh, yeah, not good. I would um, not have guessed that. So I don't know what I would have guessed, but. That wasn't not, it. Not that. <laughs> not that. Like, I would have guessed somebody left out milk too long. Or I, like, that's what I they thought. Were, they were taking milk to, like, deliver it to somebody. But, and I mean, it kind of was that. So, people used to have dairy, and they didn't have cups. So, what did they carry it in? They carried it in, like, stomachs. Animal stomachs. Of animals. And without knowing it, by pure accident, they carried dairy in the stomach of an animal and the enzymes to make cheese was discovered there because they were wandering Renant. around. Yeah, Renant. They were wandering around one day with their stomach tied just to their belt. It around. Yeah, just sloshing <laughs> on their adventures. And then they get there and they're like, this milk is chunky now. I'm still going to eat it though. <laughs> and then there was cheese. <laughs> then cheese was born. And, and there was like, and don't get me wrong, this is a a staple food for everywhere, I think, at this point. Let me point. ask you, Zach, how much do you love cheese? I don't love cheese. I Zach don't love cheese. is an animal in the fact that he doesn't love cheese. I 
It kind of. Sa- I will say, I know you enough to know that you're not actually a picky eater. But this episode makes it sound like you're a picky eater because you're like, I'm not crazy about tomatoes. I don't like cheese that much. You no, know, what here's I mean? the thing: <laughs> if it's a fresh tomato, I will eat it every time. And like on a sandwich, I used to eat tomatoes like apples when I was a kid. I would literally just pull them out of the fridge and eat the whole thing, like the whole thing. I still do it every now and then, but now I put a little salt. Sometimes and mayonnaise. I, I don't even know it's, if it's worth <laughs> going into uh, my cheese stuff. Everyone I've talked to about doesn't get it. I'm fine with cheese as part of a thing. You will never find me eating just like cheese sticks or just cubes of cheese. <laughs> I ate cheese sticks tonight. Yeah, I don't. Mm, <laughs> won't happen. But as part of like a thing, I never like, I never fight back on it. But no, I'm not like a, a person who has to just like stuff myself with cheese ever. But I like pizza. You know, I I'm a complicated cheese. person. Dude, you give me a charcuterie board and I'll be so happy. I love cheese and I love meat. No, and I don't mind give charcuterie board Woo! as bad because you can throw like pickles. It's like a mini sandwich. Pickles, Talk meat, about Spain cheese. again. I want to go to Spain so bad because the thing that I remember is going to all these bars as a kid with my parents and just being blown away by how good the cheese and meat was. And you get it for freaking free everywhere you go because they have tapas and tapa bar in Spain is you buy a drink, you get a free appetizer. That's what it is. It's not, I hate when I see people like, I'm going to go to the tapas bar and then get appetizer for like 15 bucks each. And it's like this tiny little thing. It makes me so triggered. Cause no, I'm like, they took a, I've been to a tapas bar. <laughs> I've been it's to a tapas genius. bar. The, the only thing you pay for is drinks. Everything else is free. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's genius marketing on their part. They're like, we're going to let's give them less food and charge them more and call it tapas. Let's give them a lunchable and then charge them freaking 15 bucks for if it. If someone charged me $15 for a <laughs> lunchable, they're getting punched in the head. Uh, no, uh, but basically, uh, I don't know. I have a complicated relationship with cheeses, but in like a charcuterie setting, it's usually fine because it's not like I'm just going to eat a piece of cheese. It's going to be like a, that's the real version of a, of a lunchable is uh charcuterie. But yeah, so basically they discovered the the way <laughs> the weird way to make cheese which is wandering around and after that it began to evolve in different ways um so i you said it was i think it was the romans who were yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. because it was italian it was like mm-hmm. romano yeah. and uh parmesan really hard cheeses that literally you have to like crack open with like a hammer and a chisel and they would carry those around with their warriors because it would maintain its structure and they could eat it while they're traveling and things like that. I don't know why, but for some reason it reminded me of like Lord of the Rings and the litmus bread. <laughs> yeah. No, it's basically the same concept. It's like, just hang on to it. Uh, but also I wanted some hard cheese when I, when I heard about it, I want some hard cheese now, but then they talked about literally like the oldest cheese that was ever discovered. And it was 3,000 years old. And they literally found it like in an Egyptian tomb. Uh, and luckily, no one tried to eat it because apparently when they actually analyzed it, it had like a an ancient bacteria that was very, uh, very, very bad and could kill you very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, maybe don't eat random stuff out of tombs. I mean, it seems like that's a that's an easy easy rule to set. It's not something most of us are ever going to uh, run into. Then he actually talks about something that I think you brought as a discovery on Todd's once, right? I don't think I ever ended up discussing it. I think we talked about it like on a gaming stream as one of the discoveries I was going to bring. But oh, I didn't end up maybe doing I just it. saw the link somewhere. You posted the link somewhere. Yes. So this one, that's why I, I mentioned it last week, I believe, that this was one of my discoveries that I was going to bring, but I haven't brought it yet. And it was that Andrew Jackson, when he became president, a cheese farmer um, to help celebrate this new president that he loved and wanted to, you know, and basically say welcome to being president, the thing, uh, this farmer decided to give 
Andrew Jackson a giant wheel of cheese. It it took 150 dairy cows being milked for four days to create this wheel of cheese, and it was almost two tons. It was huge. And then it went on uh, a little northeast tour on its yeah, way it went to on the a White tour. House. On its way to the White House. You were like, well, you look at the size of that cheese. Would you look at the cheese? Yeah, see, breaking news. the biggest cheese I've ever seen. (laughs) Uh, um, People were bored. There was no internet. (laughs) There was no internet. There was no TikTok. Um, There was no TikTok. uh, Even if there there was TikTok, you know that everybody would be taking TikTok videos of the cheese. (laughs) For sure. Um, I I wanted to read this one quote. It, it, It talks about... Because... He didn't eat the cheese for a long time. It literally sat in the White House for almost eight years. Uh, and, and then this is by far the most disturbing part of the story to me. <laughs> hey, it was aging. It was it was getting better. It's like a, it was cheese is like up a the White fine House. wine, but cheesy. Uh, um, it's like a fine cheese, <laughs> <laughs> fine aged cheese. Anyway, uh, he decided to break out the cheese. He decided to cut the cheese. On his his leaving party, basically, his farewell uh, dinner that he had. And there's a quote. He said, for hours did a crowd of men, women, boys and girls hack at the cheese, making large, taking large hunks of it away with him. When they commenced, the cheese weighed 1,400 pounds and only a small piece was saved for the president's use. The air was redolent with cheese. The carpet was slippery with a soft, creamy layer. Oh, this is so disgusting. And trampled as they went. And nothing else was taken about, talked about in Washington for many days after. Even the scandal about the wife of the president's secretary of war was forgotten in the tumultuous jubilation of the great occasion. The cheese. This the all sounds cheese. horrifying. Can you imagine <laughs> what it smells like to crack open an eight-year-old, 1,400-pound well, block of cheese? What do you think cheese? Parmesan is? It's like super old. Some oh, of these are Parmesan's like stanky. Ridiculous. No, but yeah, not but it like... it amazing. Yeah, but it's also not 1,400 pounds in an enclosed space <laughs> with people just like chewing on it and slipping on the floor with it and just like getting cheese air everywhere. It's a cheese slip and slide, man, yeah, just, in the White House. Place covered with cheese air and just cheese <laughs> grease all over the floor. <laughs> sounds amazing. It sounds it like doesn't. my it sounds amazing horrifying. dream. Like an amazing dream. <laughs> and I like how these savages were just like gnawing on a freaking old thing of cheese. Just like, give me a give me a wedge of that. <laughs> give me a wedge of that. <laughs> um I will say this last story, though. It was my favorite by far. was my favorite of any of these stories. It's just, it's so great. I mean, people were killed in it, but it's also so great. The time that cheese killed people. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure there's been Uh, more. There's probably multiple times. But um, it was a story about basically a battle. It was between Uruguay and Argentina, correct? uh, I think so. And so... It was a ship battle in the middle of the ocean, and I don't remember people's names and stuff like that, but they were having a battle. The Uruguayan guy's like, oh, we've got him on the run. Fire. And nothing happened. He's like, why aren't you firing, guys? And his crew's like, we used all the cannonballs. And then he's like, and this is a resourceful guy, man. This is a resourceful dude right here. He's like, Use all the cheese. And so they shoved the cheese into the cannons and they shot them at the Argentine Navy that was trying to retreat. They broke the mast of the other ship. They put holes in the sails of the other ship. There was cheese shrapnel that was freaking going everywhere. It literally killed like three sailors and and the Argentine Navy like completely ran away with their tail tuck between their legs because of the these cheese cannonballs that were fired at them. And it was great. I like <laughs> to think that he said some awesome, like, snappy little line after they run away. You know what I mean? What is that snappy line, Zach? I'm trying to think. Okay, how about, like, fondue? More like fondant. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. I don't like that one. <laughs> it's so bad. No, it's not. It's, it's so bad. So I mean, I don't have a better one, but it's so bad. <laughs> but yeah, I loved that story. That was probably my favorite story. But it was a great show. It was very well researched. If you go to the, I, I put the links in the in the live show for you know some of these episodes. 
for the transcripts. They have pictures. Um, Nick does a great job in narrating the show. And I don't know. I, I loved the show. I learned a lot. And history's crazy and food's awesome. How about this? I just made them a new tagline. <laughs> How about this? Now you're fun doomed. <laughs> no, it's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Fun, oh. don't do that anymore. <laughs> Come on, stop it. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll stop. <laughs> no, Your it stupid is stupid cheesy it's jokes. A, it's a great it's a great show. Yeah, you learn a ton. It, honestly, I've always found the origins of foods completely fascinating. I I don't know. It's just so important to culture and then there's always some weird origin story that I want to hear about. And this show does exactly that. They dig in and it's, it's a great show and everyone should check it out. I am always fascinated. I actually was talking to my kids about this the other night at dinner. I was like, who ever thought about eating a lot of this food? I forget what we were eating. We were eating something. I'm like, who would have ever thought to eat this? Oh, I was, I was freaking cracking those pecans the other day. I'm like, who would have thought this hard nut that falls out of a tree, if you crack it open and pull out the middle of it, it tastes good. Like it's crazy to, to me to think about the first person that tried yeah. something. No, and, and some of them, they go and for a lot of time. There's no history for no, it. No, like coffee. Do you remember when we learned about how coffee was found? Someone like found it. One. I think goats were eating it and then pooping out coffee beans. <laughs> there was like seven steps. It's like, mm, okay, somebody's <laughs> not telling what happened in between this. <laughs> so something someone happened. making like, Something Coffee disturbing stew? happened or, here, or and don't lie to me and say it didn't. Goat poop stew, and yeah. then they got really awake. Yeah, they're like, oh, they're I like, feel... This is great. <laughs> I feel alive. I'm going to chase that feeling. <laughs> oh, man. But no, it's a great show. Uh, you should check it out if you're into food at all, or history, or both, like we are. Yeah, it's really um, great. I have a recommendation that I listened to today. I found the show recently, but I actually listened to the episode that I want to recommend today. A lot of these times, a lot of times I'll find a show. I'm like, this is a great show. I love the premise. I want to find that perfect episode. So it takes me a little bit to kind of like listen through the catalog and find the one that I think that we need to talk about. And I found it. It's so freaking good. The name of the show is Nice Try. And it's specifically about utopias. Most of the time, failed utopias. And I've always been fascinated by what people think is a utopia and these people that have tried to make a utopia. Um, like they talk about Disney. They talk about like Walt Disney and like the town, that celebration or whatever in Orlando. Oh, I wanted yeah. to talk about that one a little bit, but they, it was Honestly, a live show and it was good. Celebration. Like, it's I don't nice. get it either. I, I mean, it's I I mean, I, I, it's an idealized place, but, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. It, it, I feel like the, the whole thing of like the good old days feeling minus the crappy old days uh, infrastructure, <laughs> I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but I um, I don't really get. But it. the episode that I want to recommend is called Biosphere Two, and this this happened like I believe in our lifetime, Zach. I think it was like in the early '90s, so we were young, but I think it was early '90s, and it was like in Arizona, and they made this giant biosphere. I think when they they added up the cost, it was like over two hundred million dollars. Wait, is this the documentary with Polly Shore? No, it is not Biodome. <laughs> Uh, but it's very similar. It really is. Uh, it's 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 a great story. It's crazy. There's it, it, oh man. It's it's you'll see. It's yeah, so good. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so it's nice try. Biosphere two, the theater of utopia. Thank you guys for listening to the podcast discovery show. We really appreciate it. And remember, there's always more to discover. Thank you for listening to the Podcast Discovery Show. We would love for you to get in touch. We have a Facebook group called the Podcast Discovery Club, and our Twitter is at the PDS Official. We also record the show live every Friday night at 8 o'clock on Twitch. We would love for you to be part of the show while we're recording it. If you want to support the show, we have a number of ways you can do that. From our Patreon to our affiliate links, they're always linked in the show notes. 
In the end, you support the show just by listening and it means the world to us. So thank you so much for being a part of our journey. This was a podcast from the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com.